Thank you, Tracy. It is so good to be here. I'm back from the wild, wild west of Huntley, Illinois. Um, from the country to civilization, as I like to say. Um, any of you from Huntley? I, th I thought I saw a couple. A couple oh, okay, a couple of you. All right. All right, you're, you're, you're faithful, but you're quiet, so thank you. I appreciate the love. Um, God has been moving um, out at Huntley in a really cool way. And recently, we actually opened up a building, and we got a photo of our building, if you want to check that out somewhere. It's coming. Yeah, so amen to that. And just a, couple, a few weeks ago, we had our, our pastor, Steve Gillen, came out and helped celebrate one of our grand opening weekends, and it was so cool. Um, just in one weekend, we saw 219 people commit to seek or follow after Jesus Christ, just in one weekend um, in our building, so it's been really fun. And Huntley feels like home, because it's kind of in the country, and I grew up um, in the country in the Ozark, southwest Missouri, and... My preacher, whenever he would say something good, you said, amen. amen. And whenever he would, he, would, he would say something really hard and convicting, he would actually say, don't say amen, say ouch. <laughs> all right. Have you, anyone ever said ouch as, in response to a sermon? All right. All right. So, all right. There you go. So maybe you'll be saying some amens and ouches this morning. But I want to start with the story of this little country preacher. And this guy worked for weeks on his very first sermon. He was at this little church um, in Oklahoma. And he stood up in a pulpit and he looked out. And it was completely empty, except for just one dude in the back. So he went down um, out of the pulpit, kind of after the music session, and he said to this guy, he's like, hey, look, I'm just getting started. Should I still preach my sermon? There's just one dude out there. And the guy sitting out there said, he's like, you know what, I'm just this little cowpoke out here in Oklahoma. He's like, I don't know much, uh, but I do know this. He's like, if I loaded up a truck of hay and only one cow showed up, I'd feed her. So... Preacher took that as a cue, got back in the pulpit, and 90 minutes later, yeah, he finished his sermon. It's a true story. He went back down to that guy. It's, it's not a prophecy for tonight, I'll tell you that. He went back down to that guy, and, he's, and he said, hey, my friend, you stuck with me all the way through. Like I told you, he's like, I'm just a country preacher, just getting started. What do you think? And this guy, you know, sitting there in the back row, said, hey, like I told you, I don't know much about this sort of thing, but I do know this. It's like if I loaded up a truckload of hay and only one cow showed up, I sure wouldn't give her the whole load. So <laughs> I know it's country humor, country humor. You got to call it. You got to give me some grace for that. Um, so we're not going to give you the whole load tonight, um, but I am excited uh, to continue this series on sharing our faith. And I was reminded of a moment with my family last year. Uh, my wife and I were expecting our second boy. And it got me thinking how kind of all these pastors that I work with have like these biblical names, because we were trying to pick out a name for our boy. And um, like Steve Gillen's named after St. Stephen, you know, like the first martyr, patron saint of deacons and horses. And he's also the patron saint of headaches. I'm not making this up, kind of apparently because he was stoned, they, they call him the patron saint of headaches, so interesting. Um, yeah, or Matt Wright's named after St. Matthew, you know, wrote the first gospel, um, patron saint of tax collectors and accountants, that's a good one, I used to be a CPA. Um, some of you know our Huntley team. Uh, we have uh, St. Patrick Brennan, our students' pastor, St. Nick Panev, our tech director, St. Andrew Thomas, our worship pastor, all great. So I was like, surely there's got to be a St. Todd, right? There's got to be a St. Todd. So I went to Google, the place of all authority and knowledge, and sure enough, there is, I'm not making this up, there is a St. Todd the incontinent. So <laughs> if you don't know what that means, I'm not going to tell you what that means. So needless to say, we didn't name our second son. Todd. So we settled on Graham, and my wife uh, liked the name, and I like the name because Billy Graham has been a hero my whole life. Um, in fact, Billy Graham passed away, as some of you may recall, in 2018, which was the same year that our son Graham was born. So now we have a picture here of Graham, and uh, he's uh, one year old, I know. He'll be one year old next week. We're going to dedicate him at our church this Sunday. Um, and he has a loud voice, uh, just like uh, Billy Graham did. Who knows? Maybe he'll be a pastor someday. Maybe not. Who knows? Um, but Billy Graham, I think, really kind of just, you know, set the standard for what it means to live a lifetime of sharing your faith. And so today, as we're kind of in this series of what does it mean to share our faith, I want to explore qualities of two heroes. We're going to kind of conclude with Billy Graham, but I want to start with my favorite Old Testament prophet, Elisha. So if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn, out, turn it, throw them to 2 Kings chapter 2. And as you're doing that, I want to show you a map. 
And we're going to pay attention to kind of four geographical locations. I know it's kind of small over there, but many of you guys know where the Dead Sea is there down near the bottom. And right above there, you'll see a little city called Gilgal. You'll see another city called Jericho. You guys see those cities right there? And then you'll see Bethel, which is a little bit east, kind of halfway between the Dead Sea and Mediterranean. And then, you know, you'll see the Jordan River that's flowing north of the Dead Sea. So pay attention, because the geographical locations are actually really important to this text. So we're going to begin with verse 1 from 2 Kings chapter 2. It says, when the Lord was about to take up Elijah to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah says to Elijah, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. It's the first time he says this. So they went down to Bethel. So you can see they're already moving from Gilgal to Bethel. Then the company of the prophets of Bethel come out to Elisha and said, do you know that the Lord is going to take you from the master today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went back to Jericho. Then the company of the prophets at Jericho went to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha said, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah then took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, and he finally realizes, he gets to this final moment, he says, tell me what can I do for you? Before I'm taken from you. And then here's Elijah's response. Here's what he fought so hard to ask him. He's like, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. I want to pray. God, we're here for you. And we want to hear from you. And God, I do pray that you would help us understand what does it mean to grasp this vision of having a double portion of your spirit, Lord God. Because, God, we are in a season in our church, and I'm sure we are in seasons in our lives where business as usual will not cut it. There is no question in our mind we need a double portion, God. So speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, let everyone say Amen. Amen. All right, the first thing I want to notice as we're kind of diving into the text is the meaning of their names. And I'm kind of a Hebrew, like, you know, a nerd, so I love to look at this stuff. So, because in that day, especially, your name said a lot about who you are. So, uh, the first uh, name we're going to look at is Elijah, and that means, my God is Yahweh. Say that with me, my God is Yahweh. And then Elisha means, my God is salvation. Say that with me, my God is salvation. See, that's way better than St. Todd the Incontinent. You can see names, names matter. So these prophets, they had powerful names, and they knew their name. And that gets at kind of this first quality of what does it mean to share. It's this idea of having confidence in your identity. And I want to ask you, how many of you actually know the meaning of your name? How many of you know the meaning? Okay, I see, I see a number of you. You know, some of you do and some of you don't. Um, hopefully it means something different than, you know, the, the saint that is, I, I was named after. But um, even if you don't know the meaning of your name and even if you don't have a name that you can take confidence in, the Bible has a promise about the name that really matters. In fact, Revelation 2.17 gives us this promise and says that we actually receive this new name, this name that no one understands except the one who receives it. And it's a really big deal because God is kind of setting us off. He's like, it's not about what your parents called you. It's not about how your past defined you. It's not about your pain. It's not about any of those things. He's saying, it's about the unique name that I have given you, and it's about the name of the one you're called to proclaim. That is where we get our foundation as we approach what does it mean to share. But the second thing I want to notice is Elisha's persistence. He's not going to let Elijah go without actually making this request. And again, as I'm sure you guys know, the Hebrew Bible um, doesn't have italics, it doesn't have bold, it doesn't have underlines, so whenever it wants to make a point, it just repeats it over and over and over again. So the whole point of this text is trying to get at the fact, what is the thing that was repeated three times? And it was this idea that Elisha was persistent. He was persistent in making this one request to Elijah. And again, what was that request? It was that he would inherit a double portion 
of your spirit. And again, that request was a bold request. And the idea of a double portion actually goes way back to the patriarchs in the book of Genesis. Because back in those days, if you ever read the genealogies, you would know that they have long, long lists of names, right? You know what I'm talking about? You just long, long lists of names. And the reason they did that is because in an agrarian society, they needed a lot of kids to kind of, you know, do the various business on the farm and all that sort of thing. But the problem was, is if you had a lot of kids, then you, then you had to divide up your inheritance among all those kids. And then over time, what would happen is you would find that the family line would get weaker and weaker and weaker because unless you were getting more and more land, you would have less and less land per kid. So they came up with this idea where you'd have a double portion where the oldest child would actually get twice as much as everyone else. So I am the youngest of three boys, and I know I'm talking fast because I just want to give you all this right away. So I'm the youngest of three boys. And if, it was like, if we had 12 acres of land, you would normally think you would get four, four, and four, Right? But this would actually say that you pretend you have one more child and the oldest gets the first two. So the oldest would get six and then the younger two would get three and I'm the youngest so I would only get three. So I'm really glad that we don't follow the double portion law. So anyway, I'm not sure, I, I don't know if you care about that, but nevertheless, it, it's, it's this really important concept that gets us this idea of asking for twice as much as you could normally expect. And I don't know, are, are, do any of you guys um, have kind of an ethnic background who are Swedish, even a little bit Swedish? A few of you? Okay, okay, all right. A few proud Swedes in the back. There you go. So um, you may have a similar background. as like The reason that my family actually immigrated to the United States is because we were running out of land. And there is this Homestead Act in the you know, center part of the country that actually said that if you just moved here, you would get 160 acres for free. And so, again, it's, it's this idea of that we're just desperate to try to get, have enough land to kind of live off of. So it's kind of a really important thing. So, again, Elisha comes... And he's like, all right, Elijah, you have been the biggest and the most powerful prophet Israel has ever seen. You know, it's like the fire from heaven at Mount Carmel, Elijah, if you remember that story. It's the raise the widow's son back from the dead, Elijah, from that story. It's like Elijah was like the Michael Jordan of the prophets. And again, not the Aaron Rodgers, you know, no Packers fans allowed in midweek, I understand that. Aaron Rodgers would be like Goliath or Jezebel or something like that, so thanks for the claps there, I appreciate that. So... So Elijah's like, I want a double portion of the spirit of the dude who is the most powerful prophet ever to walk. I mean, that's, that's a pretty bold request, right? That's like a super bold request. And he, he, essentially, it's like, it's like imagining that we would say, hey, well, we, we want to have the Chicago Bulls. Not just bring on someone who's going to be the next Michael Jordan, but who's going to be twice as good as Michael Jordan. I don't think that's even possible. Michael Jordan's the, the GOAT, the greatest of all time. But I think like, that's the type of request that he's making. And I just want to kind of challenge you, as you think about how you've been involved in this church family, how has God met you in your journey? Like what portion have you received from being part of our church? I know you guys are getting a little scared, like where is he going, what's he doing? So, because I did a little journey around, around of just, I did a little kind of journey down my own little memory lane and I remember all the different places that I've been sitting in this, this very auditorium. I remember in 2001, kind of walked in those doors. I'd actually gone to Access because I was a young 20-something. Long before I met my wife, I was just looking for a date, really. So, but I, I, I stumbled in here, and I remember God rocked my world. And my vision for how God could expand the kingdom of God was completely changed through this church. And I literally remember just sitting there on my knees, weeping, being like, God, whatever you might do to use me to build your church, man, I'm going to do it. Man, I'm going to do it. I'll never forget what happened in that seat. And then I remember, a few years later, that was about, I was about 23 years old. Then about five years later, I'm 28 years old. I've been working in business for a number of years. And I remember, I, I'm not actually going to jump the seat here because that would be weird. But I was sitting about right here, and I joined our staff. And I remember being like, I couldn't believe that I actually got to be part of our staff team and help build this church. And then as Tracy was describing, a few years later, I had the privilege for about three years of actually standing right here next to Joanne and many of the amazing team members here and just worshiping God with many of you and just seeing God do incredible things. And for me, like this place is a place of holy ground because God has met me in so many ways in my seat in this place. And I want to ask you guys one more time, how has God met you in your seat? 
How has God got met you in your seat? Because I have no doubt that, you know, some of you, you're like, Todd, I just showed up here for the first time. I don't even know why I'm here. So if this question doesn't apply to you. But for the rest of you, you're here because as we've talked about already, you've encountered God. God has met you here. But in this next season for our church, I think God is saying, don't pray for a shadow or for kind of the remnants of the blessing that we've had. He's like, don't even pray for like the same amount. Don't pray for another Michael Jordan. He's like, don't even pray for the same. He's like, you know what? Pray for a double portion. He's like, will you get on my knees? Will you be persistent? Will you be bold? Will you be confident? Will you pray for a double portion of evangelistic impact for our church and for your life and for us to see crazy things? I think that that's, God, that's what God's calling us to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. But also, I want to get personal for just a moment before we go on. And I ask you, where do you need a double portion in your life? Where do you need God's double portion? And Because we ask for a double portion whenever you know that the normal prayers and the normal ways of pursuing God and the normal habits just aren't cutting it. And maybe, you know, I was talking to someone this past week who's really struggling with one of their kids. And maybe like, you know what, Todd? I need a double portion in God's favor with my son. Maybe you're like, I need a double portion of God's favor as it relates to this health issue that I'm facing. I would just encourage you, where do you need this double portion of God's favor for him to move? Or maybe you have a heart for our city and there's these, I mean, there's our city, we love our city, we love this community, but it is, it's a tough place and there's a lot of hard things that are happening. Or maybe you're like me and you're a huge football fan, right? And maybe you're praying for a double portion for the Bears, you know? Maybe not just win a playoff game this year, but win the whole Super Bowl. I mean, it can happen. We can pray for a double portion. And if we don't pray for a double portion, we may get another double doink. I'm just saying, it certainly is possible. <laughs> I thought that was funnier in my head, but nevertheless. <laughs> but speaking of the Bears, back in 1962, um, at Soldier Field, there was this Billy Graham crusade. Was anyone at that crusade? I just thought, I'd, I, okay, I didn't think so. I know you, know you guys are all young like me. So, Oh, oh I, I'm missing it. All, all right, all right, we'll talk after. That's so cool. That's so cool. All right, cool. You can correct me if I'm wrong. So just shout me down. So, so, so Billy Graham, he had been so excited. He'd done a crusade in New York. He'd done a crusade in Los Angeles. But he'd wanted to do one in Chicago. And he'd been, he was facing a lot, a lot of opposition. In fact, many of the churches were not coming alongside him. In fact, the media and the TV outlets were kind of pushing against him. Um, and he was wondering, was this Chicago crusade actually going to work? And I want to look at three qualities that Billy Graham demonstrated kind of in this crusade that he demonstrated really all throughout his ministry, because I think that will also help us for this. And the first one is simply his humility. And again, I have, you know, been studying Billy Graham my whole life, just love, you know, just I'm so um, impressed by him. And, you know, there's this particular quote that he prayed over and over again that I just cannot get out of my head. It simply says, oh God, let it to be to thy glory and let there be no self. Let it be to thy glory and let there be no self. And again, God honored that prayer. You know, James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And you get to see that again and again in his ministry. It's just incredible. This guy who was so well known, who everywhere he went, people knew who he was. They recognized his voice. He was the most humble of men. It reminds me of this birthday card that I came across recently. And, you know, on the front it says, once upon a time, a special human being was born to change the world. And you open it up and it says, calm down, it's not you, it's Jesus. (laughs) But it's a good reminder, right? It's a good reminder of the name that matters. And, you know, I think that God, even in the difficult season that we've been, you know, with with Willow for some of us, God can use seasons that kind of humble us low in order to do a work of humility and heart for him to raise us up as he wants to raise us up in his timing for his purposes and for his glory. And he helps just kind of nurture in us this sense of desperation and this sense of desire that no circumstance can shake. And Billy Graham knew that. If you read the stories of his life, it is incredible the amount of opposition he faced, but he didn't face it with a sense of pride. He faced it with a sense of humility. Again, I'm from the country, so you're gonna have to hear another little story about a country farmer. I apologize about these. Um, but um, there's you know, a particular one where a guy you know, kind of asks you, he's like, 
you know, what do you call a deer with no eyes? Anyone heard this? What do you call a deer with no eyes? And you'd be like, I don't know. And then the, the, the farmer's like, he's like, you know, that's right. No idea. <laughs> this is funny stuff. This is really funny stuff. I know. Come out to Huntley. You'll hear every week, lots of country humor every week. But he's like, ouch, <laughs> thank you. Well played, well played. We're, we're not done with the joke. So, <laughs> so, so the guy's like, hey, son, um, um, what do you call a deer with uh, no eyes and no legs? And of course, you're like, still, I don't know. He's like, still, no idea. So <laughs> get it, no eyes. All right, all right, okay, we're done with country humor. All right, sorry. But the, the point is, we have no idea what God's going to do but we know he's going to be the one who does it. We have no idea. And sometimes that's exactly the place where we need to be when we're waiting for God to move. And God will take this sense of humble desperation and he will use us and he will do something incredible because that is the culture on which the kingdom of God is built. In fact, years ago, there was this group of Wheaton College students, and they were actually doing a few weeks of study abroad in England, and they went to the home of John Wesley. And John Wesley, you know, was the founder of the Methodist movement, an incredible man of faith. And there was a particular place actually in his room where he would kneel down and he would pray. So they went to the home of John Wesley, and you could still see the marks of where he would pray. So they went to the home, and they went to that room, they saw that room, they got back, and they noticed that one person was not with them. So they went back, and they saw that this one person was there on their knees, crying out to God, saying, God, what you did in the days of John Wesley, might you do it again in our day? Might it be true of us? And again, who was that person? It was Billy Graham. It was Billy Graham. At that time, he was a no-name college student. No one knew who he was. But he was desperate for God to move in his day. And it was that culture of desperation and that power of prayer, which is the next quality I want to look at briefly. Again, people would ask, what was the secret of Billy Graham's revivals? He was like, he's like, it's not that I'm the best preacher. I mean, he was a great preacher, but he's like, it's just one thing. It's just prayer. He would have prayer rallies. He would have prayer groups. He would have prayer all through. He would have personal prayer. And there's a quote that kind of captures this. It says, never put a comma where God has put a period, and never put a period where God has put a comma. Because there were so many times when he was facing barriers where people wanted to put a period, full stop, on the ministry that God had for him. And he's like, no, I'm I'm, I'm telling you, it is just a comma. He's like, just just keep on praying. We're going to change that around. And again, I want to ask you, is there anyone who God's put on your heart to share your faith? And if you're honest, you're like, I'm kind of tempted just to put a period. I'm kind of tempted to stop making those prayers. And God's like, no. He's like, just put a comma. Just keep praying. Just keep seeking me. Just keep following after me. He's like, I am going to show up. Just never give up on that. And the final quality I want to get at that Billy Graham mentioned so well or modeled so well is urgency. In fact, I love this quote from Billy. It says that evangelical harvest is always urgent. He's like, there is never a time not to be on our knees so that people might find Jesus. In fact, for that crusade in Chicago, he found that he persevered, he prayed, all these things happened. They ended up having 16,500 people come to Jesus through that crusade. And that final rally, which my friend over there was at, at Soldier Field, had 116,000 people gather, and it was in 100-degree heat. I actually heard that it closed early. She can correct me later if I'm wrong, but it's what I've read. So, and um, in addition to my friend here, there was another person in that crowd, and this was a, a young woman um, who'd grown up in, in the center part of the country in Minnesota, 18-year-old, just graduated from high school. And that woman was my mom. And if you look at that, you know, picture of Soldier Field, I tried to pick her out. I couldn't pick her out. I'm not sure if she's there. (laughs) But who knows? Who knows? (laughs) But God used that rally to to do a massive spiritual work in my mom's life. And my mom's been an incredible person in pouring into my spiritual legacy. And I'm like, man, I'm so glad Billy Graham didn't put a period 
on his desire to have a crusade in Chicago. I'm so glad. And again, that's just one story of 116,000 people who were there that one day. Who knows the scores of people who would be in heaven because he didn't put a period where, or it, where God had put a comma. So again, I just want to challenge you kind of as we conclude our time. I want to say, will you have a Billy Graham-like urgency in sharing your own faith? There have been a couple questions that God's kind of been using me as I've, using to, as I've been thinking about. How do you have this urgency? And the first one kind of gets at whenever you're talking to someone, whenever you're having any conversation, just have this question floating in your head. Is there any good reason not to ask them to invite Jesus into their heart right now? Is there any good reason not? In fact, recently I was having coffee with a guy, and this guy kind of showed up at our church. It was the first time he'd ever been in a church like ours. First time ever, kind of showed up. And we're having coffee a couple days later, and I could just see that God was working in his life. I could just see it. And, you know, then, you know, I started being like, oh, maybe I should kind of challenge him and I can just kind of push him a little bit on his faith. And, but then suddenly the next coffee appointment showed up and I'm like, well, maybe I don't have time to do it. And then I was like, well, what's he going to say or whatever? But I felt like God had this question. He's like, is there any good reason not to just make an invitation for this guy to accept Jesus? So then that kind of brought me to the second question. I felt like God's like, Todd, you just have to do it. And again, the second question is, is when you're talking to a person, is there any good reason to keep you from committing your life to Jesus right now? Is there any good reason? And again, so as I was talking to this guy, that's exactly what I said. I'm like, hey, you, you seem like God's working in your life. I know it may seem, you know, we're in a coffee shop, whatever, but would you, I mean, are you ready to accept Christ right now? And I was expecting a lot of resistance. He's like, absolutely. He's like, let's do it. I'm like, great, wow, that was easy. <laughs> so then we, we prayed, a, you know, we prayed a prayer and he, you know, he committed and we've been emailing ever since and it's just been so fun to see God moving in his life. But it was just another example of, man, if we just have this urgency about us, if we just have this posture that's just looking for an opportunity. Again, not because we're trying to push someone, but because the joy of Jesus is radiating from our lives. It's the best thing we got going on in our lives. And wherever, whenever we're talking to someone, we just keep asking. You know, we're not going to be weird. We're not going to be crazy. We're not going to tell a bunch of country jokes like I do right now. But we're simply going to be like, is the spirit moving in their lives is there any good reason why we wouldn't ask them? I just think it's really, really important. And some of you guys know who've heard me tell stories before that I am a runner. I absolutely love to run. So Chicago Marathon, yeah, okay, there we go. Got one shout out, great. So the Chicago Marathon's coming up, and there was a season where I ran like a whole bunch of Chicago Marathons. I even ran an ultra marathon. There was a time when I told, I gave a whole message about almost dying running a marathon, so I've done a lot of marathons. So anyway, I've gotten old, as you can tell. I'm an old man now, so I'm far past my prime. Um, so many days, it's cold outside, so I don't go outside and run. I just kind of run on the treadmill. So I was doing that for a number of months, and our treadmill was starting to kind of get not work perfectly. So I would, just, I would start running. I'd kind of do my type in eight miles per hour, and I'd, just, I'd run you know, a little bit, do my four miles, and I'd be done. So I did that for a while, longer and longer and longer. But the treadmill started not working more and more and more. But I'm really frugal. I don't want to fix a treadmill. So I just keep kind of making it work over and over and over and over and over again. So keep doing that again and again and again. Finally, we've had enough. We're like, we got to fix the treadmill. Got to fix the treadmill. So we bring in this guy. We pay him a hundred and some odd dollars. And I start running. And I'm like, this treadmill, I punch in my eight miles per hour. I'm like, it's completely broken. I'm starting to run. And all of a sudden, it's like going faster and faster and faster. And all of a sudden, I literally nearly fall off the treadmill. I'm like, this guy like completely messed with the gears. He messed with my treadmill. I mean, that's like my one prized possession, right? And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. He actually fixed the treadmill, but my pace had slowed down. My pace had slowed down. And he had slowed down little by little by little, but I didn't even notice. I didn't even notice. And then God really convicted me. He's like, you know what, Todd? Your heart for reaching those far from God, your pace of the pulse of your heart has slowed down. He's like, are you really on fire? It's like there were seasons in your life when you were just looking for an opportunity to share the incredible message of the love of Jesus with people around you. He's like, you didn't even notice but the pulse of your heart has slowed down for the thing that matters most in my heart. And it was really convicting for me. 
And since that moment, God's been firing me up. He's like, Todd, you need to surround yourself with the stories of people who are passionate for reaching those far from God. That's why I've been reading, you know, the biography of Billy Graham and reading about people like John Wesley, surrounding myself with these people that will not allow the heartbeat of my heart for what matters most to slow. And again, I want to challenge you with that here tonight. I want to challenge you just, you know, again, just between you and God, are you in a place where you might feel like the heartbeat of your heart has slowed down? Again, this has been especially powerful for me just this past week. I got a call late last week from a woman in our church, about a woman in our church. Three years ago, I had the privilege of baptizing her and her husband, and then the next year, uh, she got cancer, then she had a two-year fight, and then last week, she passed away. And this Saturday, I have the privilege of doing her funeral. It'll be the first funeral we have in our building. Um, And it's been really hard, but honestly, she knows Jesus, and I know where she's at, and I can celebrate with that. And then just Monday, I got an email from a guy. And this guy I've met with multiple times. We've emailed back and forth because he has, you know, a number of kids. And, you know, and he's, one of his kids has just been, just been going through a really, really hard season. So we've just been emailing back and forth and praying back and forth. And we're like, God, what are you going to do to reach this kid? And then I got this email from this guy. He's like, you know what, Todd? I would never have believed it. It's like my son accepted Jesus today. That was just two days ago. No, absolutely. Please do clap for that. And God wants us to all be lit on fire to pursue people in our lives with the incredible love of Jesus and the incredible message. Again, that's what Elisha was about. That's what Billy Graham was about. But for Elisha, after he'd asked for this double portion of Elijah's favor, it's so cool. Because again, we don't want, we don't want to know what's going to happen, right? The, uh, the Bible records eight miracles of Elijah. Want to guess how many miracles it records for Elisha? Sixteen. Twice as many miracles. God grants his request for a double portion. In fact, I, again, I'm kind of a, be, a Hebrew scholar nerd, but if you actually take the name Elijah and Elisha and you combine those together, you get the name Jesus. You combine the Jah and the Sha and it's Yeshua and it's Jesus. And there's like eight other transliterations to get there, which we won't go into tonight, but I can tell you afterwards. <laughs> But the point is, is that name, that name is the only one that matters. And that name is the only one that's worth giving our life for. So I just want to challenge you as you wrap up our time. I think there may be some Billy Grahams in this room. And the beautiful thing about looking at Billy Graham's story is he was passionately praying on his knees in his 20s, but he was giving world-changing sermons in his 80s or 90s. So unless you're 147, you're not off the hook. And I do, with all my heart, I believe that God has someone in every single one of your lives that he wants you to be the one to tell about Jesus. And I just want to ask you, who is that person? Who is that person? And will you approach that person with a sense of boldness, with a sense of persistence, not once, not twice, but three times, with a sense of confidence knowing that it's not about your past or your pain or your parents or anything else. It's about the name of the one we proclaim. Will you approach that person with humility? Again, it's not about you. It's not about anything that you have. It's about who Jesus is. Will you approach that person with prayer and will you approach that person with urgency? So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads right now. And again, you know, more than learning about Elisha or learning about Billy Graham, I think God wants us to just commit our hearts just to do an honest gut check of how fast is our heart beating for sharing his love with those who need him most. God, I come to you. And God, I do pray for each of us here. God, I pray that you would just give us a posture of urgency. God, for some of us, there's someone, and we know that person right now, and it might even be sending them a text, a Snapchat, an Instagram tonight. Who knows? Some of us, we're not even sure how to make that next step, and you're not even going to give us that clarity. You're just going to say, hey, be watching for an opportunity. And when that opportunity comes, you're going to speak, and we're going to have a posture to move, a posture 
to try to share our faith in whatever way would make sense in that moment. And God, for some of us here, God, some of us, you may be calling to have a massive change in our lives. Again, some of us here, may, you may actually be calling to be a future Billy Graham. Some of us may have a job that we know we shouldn't be working in anymore. Because you're calling us to leave that job and to do something different in a way that will more directly proclaim your name. Some of us have some free time and you know that you're calling us to use that time in a way that will build your church or proclaim your name, Lord God. And God, above all, we just thank you so much that you didn't hold back whenever we needed a savior. That you pursued us and you called us. And it will be your grace and your power and your presence that will guide us and that will go with us. So God, I just pray that your spirit would move. And God, as we continue our time in worship and reflection, Lord, just help our eyes be expanded and how incredible our Savior is. It's in his name we pray.